Thank you, Dalton. That was wonderful. Love that song. Our God is a good God, right? He is faithful and he is true and he loves us. All right. Well, let's go ahead and start with prayer and we'll get into the word here. Father, we come before you, humble ourselves before you and your mighty word here. We come with expectant ears to hear what you have to speak to us today. Holy Spirit, reveal the truth that you've had stored up in your word that you're ready to reveal to each and every one of us. So show us what you would have us know in your word today. Speak to us this revelation, this fresh anointing by your spirit. Thank you, Father, for sending your Son, the holy living word of God, that we might know you, that we might have a relationship with you. So, Father, speak through me and that my brothers and sisters can hear this truth about what you have going on in the book of Acts and relating it to us today to see your power and to see your glory and to see your love. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, so we're continuing our study through the book of Acts, so if you want to go ahead and open up your Bibles, we're in Acts chapter 18, and today we're going to be looking at verses 1 through 17 as Paul is journeying over to Corinth in Greece, so that's what we're going to be looking at today. And so as we've been studying the book of Acts, you, we specifically the second half of the book of Acts, whenever we're studying the life and travels of the Apostle Paul, and we've seen the gospel go forth to the world, and this is what the, the, the proclamation from our Lord and Savior said to the, his dis- disciples whenever at the very beginning of Acts. Remember what he said in Acts 1.8? He says, and you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And so this is the progression of the book of Acts. This is a progression of how the gospel has gone forth to the world. You know, it started in Jerusalem, spread out to Judea, spread out to Samaria, and then the ends of the world. And the ends of the world, if you remember, it started in Acts chapter 10 with Cornelius with Peter and then it just branched forward with Paul who is the apostle to the Gentiles and so now Paul we're seeing is bringing the gospel to the ends of the earth and so that's what we've been really having a fun time looking at this second half so today we're in Acts chapter 18 and we find Paul, he has traveled down to Athens, remember, and he, he preached in Athens, we saw that last time we met, and then now what he's doing is he's traveling over to Corinth right there, about 50 miles west of Corinth. But by way of review, I kind of want to look back at where Paul's been just really quickly because it really ties into what we're seeing as the gospel's going forth. We're seeing him in the middle of his second missionary journey now, and it's so fun to now start seeing the, the network of the gospel. I love to call it the network of the gospel as Paul is, is branching forth the gospel to the world. And so if you remember, it all started in Antioch, Syria. That's whenever really, that's the hub of Christians. This is where they were first called Christians. This is where Paul always goes back to Antioch, Syria. This is his home base. And so from Antioch, Syria, remember on his first missionary journey, he goes over to Cyprus and then he pr- travels up to Pamphylia and he's, he teaches to the churches in, or he goes to Galatia and he brings people to faith in Galatia. And remember in Lystra here, the two things happen. This is where he meets Timothy, and I think Timothy becomes born again there, but that's also where he gets persecuted and stoned to death, right? So that was his first missionary journey, kind of a short one. The second missionary journey, he goes back to Antioch, but then he, he travels again back to this Galatian area to see how the churches are doing. And so notice what he's doing. He's establishing and strengthening churches as he's going. He's got a deep concern for these churches as he's going through. Then he wants to go up here, he wants to go over to, you know, Asia, but the Spirit forbids him. He wants to go up to Bithynia, but the Spirit forbids him. And the Spirit's bringing him over specifically to Troas so he can find brother Luke. And this is really fun because now we see Luke picks up in Troas and he starts traveling with the Apostle Paul. So then they now go up and at this point it's Paul, Silas, and now Luke and Timothy's joined with him and he goes up to Philippi. Now some fun things start happening in Philippi because we see the first convert of Macedonia is Lydia and she opens up her house to the first home church in Macedonia and that's in Philippi. So we see Lydia is now up here and then he goes over and he goes to Thessalonica. He gets chased out of Thessalonica and goes to Berea but 
remember in Thessalonica, we see another man named Jason. And Jason is now also having a home church in Thessalonica. And also we see that Luke is left behind in Philippi and he's there for six years and he's edifying and building up that church in Philippi, probably with Lydia and other people that are coming to faith. So notice this, this progression. You've got Timothy, Luke, Lydia, Jason. Now he travels down to Athens. And remember in Athens, there was Dionysius, the Areopagite. And he actually becomes the first bishop of Athens. So here we have Dionysius. Dionysius is right here and he's a major, he's a guy, we don't really see him much in the Bible but we know that from church history he was the first bishop of Athens. So he's got a home church in Athens and now he goes over to Corinth and he meets some other people, specifically Aquila and Priscilla which we're gonna see constantly wherever they go in their cities they're constantly opening up their churches open up their home to the church and they have house churches in there. So you have Aquila and Priscilla. We're going to see Crispus. We're going to see Justice in Corinth. And I think this is so fun because as we start seeing this progress and as, as um, Paul starts branching out into Rome and he starts going down over to Rome and going to Crete and he starts going over to Ephesus and he starts you know branching out and the gospel goes forth. We're going to start seeing this network of the gospel and it's so fun to see now he's got these people. You know he's got Luke up in Philippi. He's got Jason in Thessalonica. Dionysius in Athens. You know Timothy's traveling with him, but he's sending Timothy back up to these places to edify the church. He's got this network that he's he's orchestrating. It just shows the the brilliant mind of the apostle. Apostle Paul that uh, through the power of the Holy Spirit how he's orchestrating all this and that's what he says in in uh, in 2 Corinthians 11 as he tells us that there's this deep concern for the churches he's got the churches on his mind as he's going through he's got these deep concerns for the churches as he's going through this love of the church and he's going through and he's making sure that they're edified and strengthened and we're going to see some of that as he's he's you know preaching the gospel but he's sending Timothy back up to Thessalonica he's got Luke and Philippi and he's got this deep concern to make sure that they are being edified and not being swayed away into the darkness. And so I think that's so fun to see and we, as this progression starts, we start seeing it in Acts chapter 18 where Aquila and Priscilla pick up on the scene. So I think it's kind of fun just to step back for a minute and just see how this network of the gospel is really going forth. Now to speak to that, if you remember, we, this is where it's so fun too in the life and uh, the travels of Paul, we start overlaying the epistles of Paul with the book of Acts. We're going to see that a little bit today too. But you remember between Acts chapter 17 and Acts chapter 18, we have to insert 1 Thessalonians chapter 3 verses 1 and 2. Because you remember Paul, he was in Athens and he was waiting for Silas and Timothy to come join him. Well, we find out that they do join him because in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, we find that they are all together in uh, Athens, but then he sends Timothy back. So let me just read this and it kind of goes right into Acts chapter 18. So he says, therefore, when we, now that we was Paul, Silas, and Timothy, when we could no longer endure it, we, we, that's Paul and Silas, thought it be good to be left in Athens alone, and we sent Timothy, our brother and minister of God, and our fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ to establish you and encourage you concerning your faith. You know, this establish you and encourage you concerning your faith. He says, "When, when we could no longer endure it, think about those words. When we could no longer endure it, we left you in Thessalonica being persecuted and under great distress and we could no longer endure it. We were were driven out of Thessalonica but Paul with this deep concern for the churches says we got to send Brother Timothy back to establish you and encourage you concerning the faith. So that's how it starts off. So now we've got Paul and Silas are in Athens. They've sent Timothy back up to Thessalonica. Now we start verse one of chapter 18 and he says, after these things, Paul departed from Athens and went to Corinth. So as I've been studying these 17 verses this week, you know, I, we did that little exercise where we were looking at the travels of where is Paul and Silas and Timothy and where are they all going? So we know Timothy's back in Thessalonica, Paul and Silas go over to Corinth. But as I was looking at this deeper and just, you know, that's what's so fun about getting into these verses the way I do and the way we do together is we are just seeing the heart and the what's going on with these men. And it seems that Paul, I just have this really strong impression that Paul is by himself when he goes to Corinth. So I think, this is just my 
conjecture, but I think what happens is he sends Timothy up to Thessalonica. I think he sends Silas up to Macedonia as well, probably to Philippi, because later we see that they both come back and Paul is encouraged and comforted. And so I think there's, some, there's a little bit of turmoil going on because Paul is alone. Paul loves the people. He loves the brethren. Yeah, he's sending these people out with this network of the gospel, but yet he himself is alone in some of these places. And so, so I'm seeing this kind of distress going on in his heart. So I kind of want to lay that foundation as we see, and maybe you'll see it too as we go through. So here, this after these things. So Luke starts off chapter 18 and he says, after these things. Well, what things is he talking about? Well, these things that after these things, after he's established the church in Athens with Dionysius, after he sets them up, we don't know how long he was there in Athens, probably a, a couple of weeks, a couple of months, we don't really know. It wasn't much longer than that, I'm guessing. Then after he gets set up, then he, the Spirit leads him to go over to Corinth. Now what's interesting is in Athens, there's no persecution Thank you. Uh, coming against him, he leaves of his own accord. He, he's, he's just being led of the Spirit. He feels like, okay, I've, I've preached the gospel in Athens. Dionysius is set up and he's in charge. Okay, I'm going to go on over to Corinth as the Spirit is leading. So Corinth now, he gets 50 miles over to Corinth. Corinth is the capital of the Roman province of Achaia. Now, Achaia is what we know as Greece today. So we see Achaia in the Bible, that's also Greece. So Corinth was the capital of this Roman province of Achaia. And so it was the chief commercial city of Greece. So we left Athens and we said that Athens was the eye of Greece and it was the mother of all arts and eloquence. That's what, that's what they described as Athens being. Now, so if, if Athens is that, if Athens is the mother of all arts and eloquence, then um, Corinth is the mother of trade and commerce for Greece. And so it was, it was immensely wealthy in trade and commerce. And so Athens' focus was on philosophy and like all those Greek philosophers and finding the next new thing and worshiping the gods and those things. Now Corinth did some of that too, but they focused on architecture, on commerce and trade. And so that was what commerce thrived in. So, and we still see even uh, some of their architecture today with the Corinthian columns that you see. I have a little picture of it. You see that in some of, uh, some of the architecture even today. That came from Corinth. So they were big in architecture, commerce, and trade. Now the reason why they were so wealthy is because if you, this is that big map. This is the, the full map of, um, of Paul's travels. And right here is Corinth. Actually, let me switch my pins to a yellow. I think it might show up better. So this is, um, this is where Corinth is right here. Now right on you can't really see it from this map. I'm going to zoom in. But right here, there's actually what's called an isthmus. And an isthmus is a narrow strip of land that connects two bodies of water. And so here is the isthmus of Corinth. And Corinth was right on the isthmus. And so what that isthmus did is it, it allowed travel to come through this ca uh, canal all the way through here and get to the east. So if, if you were over in the west in Rome and you wanted to travel you would go right through this passageway and you would get over into Asia and, and, uh, and the Far East. Notice they did this because otherwise they would have to travel down uh, around this cape, around the Peloponnesian Islands. And from what I've read, that's a very treacherous, people didn't like to do that because there was a lot of shipwrecks and things like that. So they didn't like to do that. So they, what they did is they came through this canal. Now going to the next slide, I kind of blew it up a little bit. You can see right here, here's the Gulf of Corinth, here's this other gulf, and then this is the isthmus right here, and Corinth is right there on the scene. You can see it right here, a little bit bigger. And so this is the isthmus. Now, 2,000 years ago, um, that isthmus was just land. Right now, today, and I think it was like, I think I have it in my notes, 1893, they actually cut through this isthmus and they made it a canal where boats can actually go through there. But, that, but for 2,000 years or you know, 1,900 years, what they did is they came up to this port, they would unload their merchandise onto some type of a transport, go four miles across the isthmus, load it onto another, another boat here, and then take it wherever they want. That was still better than going around you know, the, this cape right here. So that's why Corinth, coming, th these boats would come right through here. That's why Corinth was so prosperous is because all that trade was coming through that area right there. So pretty interesting as you see why Corinth was so wealthy. Now that, that you know, this trade route gave them an influx of all sorts of people 
And so it, it made them very prosperous, but in that, there was also much sexual immorality and debauchery in this city. And so Corinth, it was actually, a, to be a Corinthian was actually a synonym of, of loose living and immoral lifestyles. It, it was, there's actually a Greek word, is Corinthiazomai. So to be, to Corinthianize, some, Corinthianize someone means that they are, you know, just full on with, you know, prostitution, fornication, sexual immorality, debauchery, just a terrible, loose living, immoral type of a lifestyle. And that's the way these Corinthians lived, Corinthiazomai. And so this is the type of people that, that Paul is now coming to preach the gospel to these, to these people, these people who are just, you know, living in this type of, um, you know, environment that's just thriving in sexual immorality and debauchery. Does that sound familiar to anybody? Are we living in that kind of a place right now? <laughs> it's, it's like I'm reading through this. I'm like, that's describing America right now. You know, the whole world, in fact. But it's like we're living in the center of these, you know, people who are Corinthiazomai. They are, they are Corinthians. I mean, it's just crazy what's going on. But this is now, this was happening 2,000 years ago. Now, um, Strabo, who is an ancient historian, he tells us that at the Temple of Venus at Corinth, there was a, uh, a sanctuary to Aphrodite where a th over a thousand priestesses were kind of always there and they were ready to give themselves so that they could worship, so people could worship the gods. It was just an act of prostitution and that was the way they, they worshiped the gods. And so it was just a way to make money. All these people coming in, traveling through this isthmus, they were just constantly involved with these terrible, wicked things. So it was, it was, a, it was a city steeped in wicked wickedness, perverse immorality, and demon worship. I mean, you read 1 Corinthians 10 and it talks about you know, these people are worshiping demons just like they did in Athens. So Paul, as he's writing his letters to the Corinthian church, he has to deal with this because these believers are coming out of that kind of a situation and they're still living in there. They're not in the world, but they're, or they are in the world, but they're not of the world anymore. But Paul has to deal with it. So turn with me over to 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and just notice what he says about some of these things. Because this is something that, you know, you talk about renewing your mind by the word of God. There's a, there's a renewal, you know, they're instantly reborn, but living in this kind of perversity, they have to renew their mind to getting out of this kind of thinking. And so if you look at this in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, specifically starting with verse 9, notice what he says. He says, I wrote to you in my epistle... Now that's gonna be kind of fun when we get to that point because did you know that there was actually a, an epistle before 1 Corinthians? 1 Corinthians is actually 2 Corinthians and there was a missing letter of 3 Corinthians and so 4 Corinthians is actually 2 Corinthians. <laughs> so that'll be fun, we'll get, to it. we'll get into that later. So anyway, he, he wrote, I wrote to you in my epistle not to keep company with sexually immoral people. Yet I certainly did not mean the sexually immoral people of this world or with the covetous or extortioners or idolaters since you would need to go out of the world. So he says you got these kind of people, sexually immoral people, and these extortioners, covetous people, idolaters. He says, you know, I'm not telling you to stay away from them because if you did, you'd have to go out of the world. They're all around you. But he's saying, now that you're a Christian, you don't keep company with these kind of people. He says, verse 11, but now I have written to you not to keep company with anyone named a brother who is sexually immoral or covetous or an idolater or a reviler or a drunkard or an extortioner, not even to eat with such person. So that tells us what kind of church the, the church of Corinth was coming, was, was you know, involved with. I mean, there were, they were people that, that were coming out of this stuff. In fact, if you look at just down to uh, verse nine of chapter six, he actually says that. This is a wonderful verse. Notice what it says. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor uh, adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. Those are the kind of people that are living in our world today and they're living in Corinth. But listen to these next words. This is one of those but God statements, right? Notice what it says. And such were some of you. That's what, that's what we can say to all of us. 
we were all those kind of people at one point in our life, and such were some of you, but God, I love this, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Praise God for that, right? He rescues us out of that pit of darkness and into his everlasting kingdom of light. And so this is the type of people he's speaking to. In fact, if you just look over in verse 18 of chapter six, he says, flee sexual immorality. Every sin that a man does is outside the body, but he who commits sexual immor- immoral- immorality sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have, have from God, and you are not your own? For you have been bought with a price. Therefore glorify your God in your body in, and in your spirit, which are God's. So he's, this is now, his, he's writing back to the letter uh, to the Corinthians, and these are the kind of people he's dealing with, is these people that are steeped, they were steeped in this debauchery state, and they've got to be renewed out of that type of thing. And so that's the, these are the kind of people he's preaching to and he's coming to. So in Corinth, he gets there, and I believe that at this point now, he sent Silas up to Macedonia, possibly Philippi. Timothy's already gone. He's in Thessalonica, and I think Paul's by himself. And he comes in, and he got, providentially, God arranges these two people in his life, and he finds Aquila and Priscilla. So notice what he says in verse two. And he found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to depart from Rome and he came to them. So this is just God's favor on the Apostle Paul. He comes to this city of Corinth, a huge city, and not by coincidence, not by accident, he comes and he meets Aquila and Priscilla, and they become very good, close friends to the Apostle Paul. There's this husband and wife team that, like I said, they open up their church, and everywhere they go, they open up a house church in their home. And so this is, now they meet uh, the Apostle Paul. Now, they meet him because they're traveling from Rome to Corinth, and there's a reason why they have to leave Rome because it says here that Claudius starting here Claudius had commanded all the Jews to depart from Rome So there's some history about this that there was a writer in the fourth century, a Roman historian that writes about this and he says that in the ninth year of Claudius' reign that Claudius expelled the Jews from Rome. And so that would have been about 49 AD. So here we are in Corinth about 52 AD. So about three years earlier, Claudius made this decree that no Jews could live in Rome anymore. Well, that's kind of an odd thing that that he would just expel all the Jews out from Rome. So why did he do that? Well, a Roman historian in the first century named Suetonius, he gives us that answer. And so he he writes in his book, Lives of the Caesars, and he says this, Claudius drove the Jews from Rome because they were incessantly raising tumults at the instigation of a certain Crestus. These Jews were (laughs) insatiable. They just kind of kept coming after them and they kept trying to come after the Christians, right? Now there's some debate about who this Crestus is. Some people think it was just a man named Crestus. I actually think that this is just another way to say Christ in, in, um, in Latin because Tatticus, who was also a Roman historian, he says this. He says that he calls Christianos. He actually calls them Christianos with an E. So Tatticus calls them Christianos. Here, Suetonius is calling them, calling Christ Christus. So I think that, and it makes perfect sense because these Jews were incessantly raising tumults at the instigation of a certain Christ. You know, that's what they would always do. Everywhere they went, they would raise tumults, they would stir up the crowd, try and get the city officials to come after and persecute and do their dirty work for them, right? We see that all through the scriptures. We've looked at that, um, you know, in the book of Acts so far. So I think what happened is Claudius, he's like, I've had enough of this. You know, you guys keep coming to me and you guys keep complaining about these Christians. You know, they're really not doing anything wrong. You guys are the ones call, causing all the trouble. I need you to leave. You're, you can't, you aren't allowed in, the, in my city anymore. He's, he's the emperor of Rome, so he has the right. If he doesn't want Jews in Rome, nobody's gonna stop him, right? So he, he kicks them out. So that's why they go to Corinth. Now, it seems like there was a big influx of Jews that come from Rome into Corinth too because it was stated that in this time, 
time, there was probably about 20,000 Jews in Corinth at this time, which was probably a lot more than there usually is. But these, because of the, you know, the decree from Caesar, um, he's bringing them, he told them to leave. Now, they probably go from a big city of Rome to the big city of Corinth, maybe because they liked big cities. We're not sure why they chose Corinth, but they come to Corinth. So now, but what we realize is that after Claudius dies, that decree goes away because uh, Aquila and Priscilla end up going back to Rome. And we know that from Romans chapter 16, when Paul's writing back to Rome and he said, he tells them, he says, make sure you greet, you know, my friends, Aquila and Priscilla. So we know that they did move back to Rome after that decree left. So, but while they're in Corinth, they open their house up to the apostle Paul. And we see that in verse three, it says, so because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked for by occupation, they were tent makers. So it's kind of fun. We know this from, uh, from the things he did in Thessalonica, that Paul was a tent maker. And this is what he did to make a wage and earn a living as he was preaching the gospel. And so he comes in, he's by himself, he needs financial provision, and so he finds this you know, fellow Jew named Aquila, and God providentially brings uh, Aquila and Priscilla into his life. Now many times we see, we've already read it in First and Second Thessalonians, that Paul would work with his own hands so as not to be a burden to the believers, to the church. He's doing the same exact thing in Corinth. So while you're in 1 Corinthians, just flip back and look at 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 12. And don't you love, I, I just think it's so fun reading, here we are in Corinth, and now we're, gonna, we're, we're reading some things in First and Second Corinthians about what's going on. I think it's just so fun overlapping the epistles with uh, the book of Acts. But if you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 12, notice what he says about this. He says, and we labor, working with our own hands, being reviled, we bless, being persecuted, we endure. So he says, we labor, we're working with our own hands as not to be a burden. And then if you go over to uh, chapter nine, he explains this a little bit more. Chapter nine, verse 12, he starts the, in verse eight, he says, you know, do I say these things as a mere man or does the law say something also? For it is written, uh, for it is written in the law of Moses, you shall not muzzle an ox while it treads out the grain. So he says, you know, it's okay. He says, I have a right to take wages from the people I'm preaching to. Um, that's what the law says. That's what God ordained. And it's, a, it's an okay thing for pastors to take wages from, their, from the tithes, from the people's tithes. But notice what he says in verse 12. He says, if others are partakers of this right over you, are we not even more? So other people were obviously doing it and they were like swindlers and people that were, you know, uh, not doing things right. So he purposely doesn't take the money and he says, nevertheless, we have not used this right, but we endure all things lest we hinder the gospel of Christ. So he says, I'm not using this right. I'm purposely, just like he did in Thessalonica, I'm not going to use this right as taking uh, money from you guys because I don't want to be a burden to you and I don't want to come off as a swindler of the gospel. So he's doing the same thing. This is what he's doing with Aquila and Priscilla. Now, it's just my personal opinion that I think Aquila and Priscilla probably owned this company. They seem like everywhere they went, they had a house. So that means they were financially well taken care of. And they seem like very smart, you know, go-getter type of people. I bet they own their own company with, uh, you know, selling tents. Paul comes in and he probably starts working for Aquila and Priscilla. And he ends up staying th with them for a year and a half and he's working with them. And so, um, so now they become such good friends with Aquila and Priscilla and they, come, they become such good friends that even whenever Paul leaves uh, Corinth after a year and a half, he travels to Ephesus, Aquila and Priscilla actually leave with him and they go and they sell their house in Corinth and they establish a house in Ephesus and they stay there in Ephesus. So pretty fun as we see Paul, you know, this network of the gospel and these friends that he's establishing there. So and everywhere they go, they're constantly, um, you know, opening up their house to the church. So Paul's in Corinth, just kind of set this stage. Paul's in Corinth. I think he's by himself. He's found a, a way to make a provision. He's found some really good friends with Aquila and Priscilla. And so now he starts preaching the gospel every Sabbath in the synagogue. And we see verse four. Remember, he always goes to the Jew first and then to the Gentile. So he says, and he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded both Jews and Greeks. Now, this is the third time we've seen this word reasoned with uh, Brother Luke saying th this about Paul because this reasoned is dialegomai. It means to thoroughly explain in a logical manner. This is what he always did. He went to the Jews in the synagogue. He explained that Jesus is the Christ with a thoroughly explaining in a logical manner from the scriptures. This is what he did. So he did this in Thessalonica. He did this in Athens. He's doing this again in Corinth. Now, 
as he's doing this, notice that both Jews and Greeks are being persuaded. They're believing in Jesus Christ. They're, they're becoming Christians. So as I said earlier that the Apostle Paul, I think, is by himself, and he's doing this by himself, but then the next verse, we're going to see Silas and Timothy finally join him back from their trip back up to Macedonia. So he's in verse 5, and he says, When Silas and Timothy had come from Macedonia, Paul was compelled by the Spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus is the Christ. Now, there's some debate about this verse. We're going to spend just a little bit of time on this because here we see Silas and Timothy, they come from Macedonia. Now we know absolutely that Timothy is up in, Mace- is up in uh, Thessalonica. I personally think Silas is probably in Philippi, but we can find, we'll, we'll read this in a little bit, that Silas comes back first and then Timothy joins him later. So we see that's kind of the scenario going on. But what's happening here is Paul's by himself, and when Silas and Timothy join with him, he's full of joy, he gets comforted, he gets encouraged. There's, there's like you know, this extra you know, empowerment and emboldenment that comes whenever he sees the brethren come to him. And I was just thinking about that. That's exactly why we're all here today is because, you know, Paul says, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together. There's a certain emboldenment. There's a certain encouragement, a certain comfort. comfort. There's a certain edification that we have when we come together more than if we're just sitting at home watching church online, right? We need to be gathering together. And when we have, we, when we have our brothers and sisters together, especially when we're going through hard times, that's something that encourages us and really comforts us. And I can just see this as I'm going through this, I can just see that Paul, he was greatly encouraged whenever uh, Silas and Timothy had come to Macedonia. Now, the reason why I say that is go back to 1 Thessalonians and we can start piecing some things together because in 1 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, notice what happens to the joy in Paul's heart whenever he sees Timothy return. So remember in verses 1 and 2, he sent Timothy back to Thessalonica. Verse 6 is him returning. So now it says, but now that Timothy has come to us from you and brought us good news of your faith and love and that you always have good remembrance of us, greatly desiring to see us as we also to see you, therefore, brethren, in all our affliction and distress, we were comforted concerning you by your faith, for now we live if you stand fast in the Lord. There was great comfort to Paul whenever Timothy joined him and sharing the good news of Thessalonica and that Timothy was safe and that everything was going good. And notice up here, just in the very first verse of chapter, uh, verse six, it says, but now that Timothy has come to us, that's Silas, that's Paul and Silas. So what ta- that tells me is that Silas returned first, then Timothy joined with them later. Now we go to verse five and we see when Silas and Timothy had come from Macedonia, I think at two separate times, now he says Paul was compelled by the Spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus is the Christ. So here we see that at the same time that Silas and Timothy have arrived in Corinth with Paul, the Spirit starts compelling Paul to do something. Now, as we read this, it says, Paul was compelled by the Spirit, and he testified to the Jews that Jesus is the Christ. Now, some scholars, they, they, and I disagree with this, but I'll just tell you what some scholars think, is that Paul was in Corinth, and he was preaching a compromised gospel and he wasn't preaching that Jesus was the Christ because he was scared. But then as soon as Timothy and, uh, and Silas joined him, he was emboldened and he, he started preaching Jesus as the Christ. I disagree with that completely because everywhere Paul goes, he preaches Christ and him crucified. Paul never compromised. He never wavered. He never did any of that. And, but it, there is a, some turmoil going on inside of him, but he's not lessening and not compromising the gospel. So I disagree with that completely. We know 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 17, you know, and, 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 go, and on, he says, I preach Christ and him crucified. I preach the message of the cross. This is what he's doing while he's in Corinth. Whether his friends are there or not, he's bold and he's preaching the gospel. Gospel. So I disagree with the scholars that say that. Now the reason why they say that, and I want to bring this up because it leans to why I think we should be reading the Textus Receptus and not anything else, is the reason why they say that is because over here, let me go back to the last screen. Whenever it says they were, that he was compelled by the Spirit, that by the Spirit is to pneumati, which means, that means by the Spirit or in the Spirit or something like that or with the Spirit. 
But in the Alexandrian text, which all the new modern translations translate, it actually says to lago, which means he was compelled by the word or he was, he was driven by the word or something like that. And they replace, they replace spirit with word. And notice what it says in the New American Standard Bible. And this is where it gets off. They, they, they're trying to understand what this means, but the problem is it's wrong. In, in the New American Standard, it's translated like this. But when Silas and Timothy came down from Macedonia, Paul began devoting himself completely to the word. I disagree with that. He, there was never a time that he never devoted himself completely to the word. He was always driven by the word. He was always compelled to the word. So it, the word of God is not what, what's, what's driving him. He's always compelled to the word. What's happening here is the spirit is impressing in his soul to speak something boldly. And now he's got comfort and encouragement from his brothers coming down. And he's got the spirit working in his life and pressing on the apostle Paul to do something. And notice what he says. The answer is right here in verse six. But when they opposed him and blasphemed, he shook his garments and said to them, your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. That's a bold statement, right? That's what the Spirit was impressing on the Apostle Paul's soul is to say that right there. He'd been preaching Christ and him crucified, but now when they opposed him, the Spirit gave him strength to stand bold. He shook off his garments and he says, your blood be upon your own heads. I'm clean but you're going to hell. <laughs> that's what he's saying here. And so that's a bold statement to say. And I think that the Holy Spirit was empowering him at this point to say those words right there. It wasn't that he was compromising the gospel or not, not devoting himself to the word. It's that the Holy Spirit was empowering him to say these words to us. That's what we can always count on in our lives. The Spirit will always give us power when we have to stand for truth. And Paul right here, when they opposed him, they, they, he's got to stand for truth. And so this is God's providence again, bringing si Silas and Timothy, is strengthening him in the, in the love of the brethren, and the Spirit is emboldening him to stand for, stand for truth, and he's ready to go to battle. And in fact, that's what this word opposed means. This says when they, that's these unbelieving Jews, when they oppose him. This word opposed is antitasso. It literally means to arrange in battle array. So these Jews are arranging themselves in battle array to come kill the Apostle Paul. And so he, the Holy Spirit is strengthening him because these Jews absolutely hated him. They want to kill him and they're blaspheming him and they're trying to um, do harm to him. So this is why, what the Holy Spirit's doing to him. Now, Paul being emboldened by the Spirit of God he shakes off his garments and he says to them, your blood be on your own heads. I'm clean. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. Now, what he's saying there is he's saying the guilt of your bloodshed is on you. You're committing spiritual suicide by rejecting Jesus Christ as your Savior. He's saying you're, you're, this blood is on you. I'm clean. I'm telling you the truth. Now behold, I'm going to the Gentiles. Now in Ezekiel, God says the same exact thing to Ezekiel. And I think I love overlaying this with what was, is going on here because this is exactly what's happening in the Apostle Paul's life. Now these are some heavy words here. And it actually gives, it's an amazing thing. Did you know that we are as Christians, our ambassadors for Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit is working in and out through us to preach his word. Now look at this responsibility that if and when the Holy Spirit pr puts this on your heart and emboldens you to speak the word and, and strengthen you, notice what he says to Ezekiel. He says, when I, this is verse 18, 318. When I say to the wicked, this is now God speaking, and he says, when I, when I say to the wicked, you shall surely die, and you give him no warning, nor speak to warn the wicked from his wicked way to save his life, that same wicked man, he will die in his iniquity, but his blood I, I will require at your hand. That's a pretty, pretty amazing thing right there that, that he's saying that we have a responsibility. If God gives us a word to speak, that, that he's telling us, okay, if they, it's our job to speak that word. And he's telling Ezekiel that if, if he doesn't speak that word, they're going to die in their iniquity, but their blood is on you. And this is why Paul says those exact words. He says, I'm clean. I've spoken the word that God's given to me. And then he goes on, verse 19, yet if you warn the wicked and he does not turn from his wickedness nor from his wicked ways, he shall die in his iniquity, but you have delivered your soul. 
So kind of an interesting thing to overlay that, that command from God in Ezekiel into what Paul is saying right here. He's saying, I've been emboldened to speak this word. He says, I've spoken the truth. You've rejected it. And so now your blood is on your head and, and I'm clean from, this, from, from your, um, your rejection. Now he says the same thing if you just flip back over to Acts chapter 13. Remember he said the same thing on his missionary journey as he's going through Antioch, Pisidia. And he says in verse 46, he says, Then Paul and Barnabas grew bold and said, That grew bold is exactly what's happening to the Apostle Paul as the Spirit is compelling him to speak these words. He, so here, Paul and Barnabas grow bold and say, It was necessary that the word of God should be spoken to you first, but since you reject it and judge yourself unworthy of everlasting life, behold, we go to the Gentiles. He's saying the same thing here. Then look at verse 51. But they shook off the dust from their feet against them and they came to Iconium. So that's what's happening here. He's shaking off his garment, garments. It tells us that whenever they shake off the sandals, the the dust from their sandals or shake off the dust from their garments, that dust is like a testimony of their rejection of Jesus Christ. That's what Jesus tells us. So here, this is what he's doing. He's saying, I'm shaking off the dust of, the, of my feet, of the dust of the garments. Now, notice what he does. He goes, he goes from the Jews to the Gentiles, verse seven, and he departed from there and entered the house of a certain man named Justice, one who worshiped God, whose house was next door to the synagogue. Now, I think that's actually kind of hilarious because no, he doesn't go very far. He goes next door to the synagogue. So here, it's not like he goes to another city. It's not like he goes to an, even another country. He goes literally next door. And so this is the Holy Spirit prompting him to go here. So this is a Gentile proselyte. We know that because he uses the word sabamanos. And so this justice is a Gentile proselyte and he's living next door to the synagogue. And it's interesting that he goes right next door. And I just, I was thinking of Romans 11, 11, because he says, but through their fall, speaking of the Jews and that they rejected Jesus Christ, through their fall and through their rejection of Jesus Christ, to provoke them to jealousy, salvation has come to the Gentiles. I think the Holy Spirit brought him right next door to provoke these Jews to jealousy. That's just, I was just getting that impression as I was going through that. And it seems to have worked because a prominent member of the Jewish synagogue ends up being converted. Notice this in the next verse. It says, then Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his household and many of the Corinthians hearing, believed, and were baptized. So here we see that CRISPR was the ruler of the synagogue. He ends up finding Jesus. He believes Jesus. He believes the words of Paul. And then because he's such a prominent leader, the other Corinthians, hearing, they believed and they're baptized. Now notice the progression. This is exactly the progression of the gospel. You hear the word with expectant ears. It goes into your soul. You have a choice. Are you going to reject it or believe it? You believe. And then if you believe, you get baptized as an outward expression of your faith. And, and that's salvation. That's that's the progression of salvation right there. So we know that this, this now is leading, this, this is now the, the first church in, um, you know, Crispus is now starting the first church in Corinth. It's pretty fun seeing this come together. You got Aquila and Priscilla, you have Crispus, and then we're also seeing Justice here is also being, being saved. So Justice now has this first church in Corinth, and Crispus ends up being, um, being a big part of it. Now Crispus, um, you might recognize that name because in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 14, Paul's saying, he says, I thank God that I didn't baptize any of you except for Crispus, Gaius, and the household of Stephanus. So he names Crispus as kind of a prominent person uh, in, the, in the Corinthian church. So the gospel is bearing fruit. And, and you know, the, many Christians are coming into the faith. Many Jews and, and Gentiles are coming into the faith. But I just start seeing this. I think that Paul, he was alone. He was strengthened by Silas and Timothy. The Holy Spirit was empowering him to speak these words. But I think that this, this opposition is wearing on the Apostle Paul. Now, he's not compromising. He's not, he's not fading away. He's not backsliding. But I think, you know, Paul, even though as tenacious as he was and as driven of a character as he was, he's still human. And I just get the impression as I'm reading through this that I think he's, he, he's getting worn down. And, and I'm thinking that he He's, he's like, 
I think these guys are coming against me. I got to leave Corinth again, just like I did with Thessalonica, just like I did with Berea. I, these guys are going to chase me out. And I think that's really wearing on him, this deep concern for the churches. And I think he's got to, he's, he's thinking he's got to make a choice that he's got to leave Corinth after, just after this is, the ball's just gotten rolling, but yet these unbelieving Jews are coming against him. And so you remember the second missionary journey. He went to Philippi. They beat him and arrested him. And then he went over to Thessalonica. The unbelieving Jews chased him out of there than Berea. So he's had persecution. And then remember, he was stoned to death in Galatia. So, I mean, he's had a really hard road. I mean, this is exactly what Jesus told him. Jesus said, you know, you're going to suffer greatly for my name. But I think that this is starting to wear on the Apostle Paul. But remember what he says in, first, in uh, Corinthians? He says, he says, in my weakness, he is made strong. There's this thing that there's this power. Whenever we get weak, and we, but we trust in the Lord, it's his empowerment that strengthens us. It's the joy of the Lord that strengthens us. It's these things. And this is what I'm seeing happen to the Apostle Paul. And notice what Jesus does. Jesus is always so faithful. He's, always so, he's such a good God because when Paul was in distress and wearied, thinking he was going to have to leave Corinth and be chased away, notice what Jesus says to Paul in a night vision. In verses 9 and 10. Now the Lord spoke to Paul in the night by a vision. Do not be afraid, but speak and do not keep silent for I am with you and no one will attack you to hurt you for I have many people in this city. Isn't that neat? As I was reading this, this verse and these verses, seeing the despair of Paul, that he's got to leave Corinth. Again, leaving, you know, remember what he said about the Thessalonians. We could no longer endure it, so we sent, Thessalon sent Timothy back to Thessalonica. He, I think he's thinking he's got to do the same thing with Corinth. I've got to be chased out, and I don't want to, but if I stay around, I'm probably going to get killed. And it's, it's this turmoil that's going on inside of him. But Jesus comes, and he says, do not be afraid, but speak Keep speaking, right? And do not keep silent, for I am with you. Man, what a wonderful uh, word of encouragement right there. So you've got the Holy Spirit encouraging him and compelling him to stand bold. You've got Silas and Timothy that are there, brothers helping him. And now you've got Jesus himself coming in a night vision to say, I am with you. Don't be afraid. D you know, just speak the word of God. I, I think this is really fun when you start seeing this all come together. Now, 2 Corinthians chapter 7, flip over there again. I love just going back over to these epistles. If you notice what this same kind of thing happened in in 2 Corinthians, and notice the heart of what's happening to the Apostle Paul, but notice the boldness that God gives him. In 2 Corinthians chapter 7, and look at verse 4, he says this, uh, verse 4, he says, great is my boldness of speech towards you. So he was speaking bold, and, and Jesus told him to speak bold and don't keep silent, right? So he says, great is my uh, boldness of speech toward you. Great is my boasting on your behalf. I am filled with comfort. I am exceedingly joyful in all our tribulation. That's a man who's living by faith. He's got tribulation all around him, but he's filled with comfort. He's exceedingly joyful in all of our tribulation. Now notice a, an aspect of why he's being joyful. Verse five, for indeed, when we came to Macedonia, our bodies had no rest, but we were troubled on every side. Outside were conflicts, inside were fears. You know, that's what he's going. He's got this turmoil. Outside was conflicts, inside were fears. You know, Jesus says, don't be afraid, right? There was, there was this fear going on in the Apostle Paul, like he had to run and he had to leave his, his uh, fellow brothers behind. But listen to this, verse six. Nevertheless, God, who comforts the downcast, comforted us by the coming of Titus. And that's, so this was on his third missionary journey, but the same, same exact thing I think is happening here in his second missionary journey with the coming of Silas and Timothy. And the Holy Spirit is emboldening him. He's being comforted by these words of Jesus Christ, and I think that's what's happening here. So he kind of gives us, gives us an insight of what's happening with this great man, the Apostle Paul. Okay, so then we go on, and verse 10, I want to point something out that's really fun in verse 10. So here Jesus says, do not be afraid but speak and do not keep silent. And then listen to this next verse. For I am with you. Now we read over that in the English and we just say, I am with you. But this is Jesus speaking. And Jesus is saying something very special here. He's saying, ego e mi metasu. Ego e mi is how Jesus would tell, would say, I am the great I am. 
I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the bread of life. All those, you know, I am statements in the book of John, it's the same thing here. He's saying, ego a me, I am, the great I am is with you. Isn't that a good statement? That the, the great I am, the one who is Jesus Christ, is with you? And that's, that's a promise that all of us have as Christians. If God be for us, who can be against us? That's what he writes in Romans. This is, this is what Jesus is comforting Paul with. He says, for I am with you. The great I am is with you and in you. And you know, this, I was thinking of 1 John 4, 4. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. This is what the Holy Spirit and, and Jesus himself is coming and, and you know, speaking to Paul in this, in this night vision, saying, I, the great I am, is with you. You don't have to be afraid. No one's gonna attack you and hurt you because I have many people in this city. That's just such a comfort. So you can see Paul coming to Corinth by himself, distressed and wearied, being attacked, but yet the Holy, look at all the things that God's doing. The Holy Spirit's compelling him to be bold. Silas and Timothy are surrounding him as brothers, and Jesus himself is saying that I am with you. You don't have to be afraid. So the harvest was obviously ripe in Corinth. There's, God has many people that are coming to Jesus Christ in this sinful city. So Paul walks by faith and not by sight. And notice what he says in verse 11. And he continued there a year and six months teaching the word of God among them. So I think what he was afraid of is that he was going to have to leave his brethren after maybe just a, a couple of weeks, but yet he stays there the longest he's ever stayed so far in his journey is a year and six months in this Corinth. And, and it's not like the enemy didn't try and attack, but the enemy did try and attack, but they, they never got, they never hurt the Apostle Paul. He was never arrested. Yeah, Randy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In other words, you know, God knew that. God knows what was going in through Paul's heart. Yes. Like, oh, man, you're going to call me there? Yeah. And all of those thoughts that go through his mind are, are our, our mm -hmm. hearts and our minds. Yeah. Like, I just know what's going to happen, or I, I just can't take it. Yes, like you can't go on. In yeah. of ourselves, mm -hmm. and then boom, he says, I'm with I'm you. With you. Those are such precious words. Man, I just, whenever I was reading that this week and I was seeing that, it's like, man, Jesus is with us. He's with us and he's for us. Man, I just, and I could see the Apostle Paul and you can just see him get strengthened right here where a year and six months he's walking by faith and he's, he's being bold and he's going on with his mission and he's teaching the word of God. I mean, I think it's just so fun seeing that all come, come together. So in the next five or six verses, we actually see the enemy try and attack the Apostle Paul. But this is the, the answer to his prayer. This is the answer to, this is Jesus being faithful to his word. So we're gonna go through these last few verses kind of quick, because it's mostly just a narrative. We'll pick out some fun things. But notice what the enemy tries to do. So verse 12, he says, when Gallio was proconsul of Achaia, the Jews with one accord rose up against Paul and brought him to the judgment seat. This is what the Jews always did, right? They would always rise up. They would always in, incite, you know, these, these terrible things against uh, Paul, and they would bring him to the officials of the city, and they would try and, you know, get him beat or, or killed or whatever. Constantly, we're seeing that. They're trying the same thing here. It's always the same tactic of the enemy when it comes to this with Paul. So here the enemy attacks. Now I'm just going to take a sidestep and I'm just going to focus on one statement here that Luke makes. It says, when Gallio was proconsul of Achaia. So we read over that, not really knowing, you know, the, the history or anything. But as I was reading this and studying this, Luke is the only one in history to ever call Gallio a proconsul of Achaia. So for 1,900 years, just like what we saw in Thessalonica, whenever Paul or Luke was calling uh, the magistrates the polytarxes, the rulers of the city, and they tried to discredit Paul or uh, Luke for saying that, here the same thing is these unbelieving historians for 1,900 years have tried to discredit the Bible and discredit Luke for saying, for calling Gallio a proconsul of Achaia because he's the only one that ever called uh, Gallio a proconsul. Until 1909, when there's a discovery, and it was on a piece of limestone, an ancient inscription in a piece of limestone, and it, it stated Gallio, the proconsul of Achaia, in the 12th year of Claudius. 
Praise God, I mean, this is something that, it, this just proves that the Bible is true, that, that Luke is a flawless historian because it's inspired by the Holy Spirit, and so even if these historians, these unbelieving historians, are dis- trying to discredit Luke, we know the Bible's absolutely true, and we keep coming up against that, and, but yet history and discoveries keep proving Luke and the Bible right. I think it's just fascinating. Plus, the 12th year of Claudius happens to be 52 AD, which is the same year that Paul was in Corinth and he was only proconsul for that one year come to find out. So Luke is absolutely right and, and this, what this also does is it, it, it gives us a milestone for dating this. You know, so many discrepancy, or not discrepancy, so many debates about, about you know, when Paul is doing these things. This is one thing in 52 AD, it's undeniable that in the 12th year of Claudius' reign, which was 52 AD, that Paul was in Corinth. And I think so we can, we can now tack that in as an unmovable date and say this is where, you know, where we can get some other dates. So pretty fun as we go. So we know that he was in, in here in 52 AD. He was, he was here in Corinth for a year and a half. So he's there from the year of 52 and 53 AD. So now uh, we'll keep going. So now this is the Jews rise up with one accord. They brought Paul to the judgment seat. That judgment seat, ha- seat happens to be the Bema seat, you know, which we, we know about the Bema seat in the end, right? Same kind of Roman terminology. So he says, verse 13, this is what they're accusing the Apostle Paul of. This fellow, this Paul, this fellow persuades men to worship God contrary to the law. So they're saying, you know, this guy is trying to tell us that we need to worship our God and it's different than what the law says. Well, this is what Paul preached. Paul preached that the law of Moses doesn't bring salvation. It just convicts you as a sinner. And and he says we're only saved, you know, by grace through faith apart from the works of the law. This is exactly what he's preaching. He he never compromises that gospel. And of course, the, um, the Jews are upset about that. So he goes on in verse 14. And when Paul was about to open his mouth, so Paul, bold in speech, right? He's ready to recant. Um, But Gallio steps in and he says to the Jews, if it were a matter of wrongdoing or wicked crimes, O Jews, there would be a reason why I should bear with you. So he says, if, if Paul actually did something wrong here, and if he, he, if he violated any Roman laws, then I would go ahead and listen to you, but he hasn't done anything wrong. There's no reason for me to ever listen to you. Now, I mention that because this, remember why Luke is actually writing the book of Acts. One of the reasons is he's writing this to Theophilus as trial documents for Paul's appeal to Caesar. And remember, it was, it was to state that Paul is not a criminal. Paul is not a person, and Christianity is not something that's hostile to, to Rome. It's actually the message of hope to the world. And so this just goes along with showing, it's interesting when you read through the book of Acts, I've mentioned this before, that every time Rome is mentioned in the book of Acts, they're always the good guys. And so here is kind of the same thing, you know, they're always rescuing Paul from being, you know, uh, tortured or killed or something like that. They, they're always presented as the good guys because um, Paul's making this appeal to Theophilus. So anyway, he goes on, uh, Gallio's not going to listen to it. So he says, verse 15, but if it's a question of words and names and your own law, look to it yourselves, for I do not want to be a judge of such matters. And he drove them from the judgment seat. So praise God, that's the favor of God right there. That's, that's Jesus saying that they're not going to be, nobody's going to attack you to hurt you because I'm going to protect you and I'm with you. So here, there's the favor of God now working through Gallio. Now, it goes on verse 17. Then all the Greeks took Sosthenes, the ruler of the synagogue, and beat him before the judgment seat. But Gallio took no notice of these things. Now this Sosthenes, um, He's a ruler of the synagogue, so there's two conjectures there. Either he is the replacement for Crispus, because Crispus became a Christian, and they needed another ruler, so Sosthenes could have been his replacement, or this synagogue was so big that they had multiple rulers of the synagogue. Either way, Sosthenes gets beat by the Greeks. Now, God's not ordaining that violence, but what he is doing is this is the favor of God keeping the enemy from harming the Apostle Paul, and just happens to be through their own free will, the Greeks, like, you you can't keep, you know, treating us like this. You can't keep bringing these insults uh, to us thinking that we're going to do your dirty work. They had enough of it. 
I, I have a feeling Gallio was probably in Rome whenever Claudius expelled all the Jews from Rome and seeing Claudius do that, he, he, Claudius wasn't gonna take any more of their stuff. And I think Gallio is doing the same thing. You tried this in Rome and, and you're trying it here. Be, you know, I'm kicking you out of my judgment seat and be careful, I'm gonna kick you out of Corinth too. You know, <laughs> I mean, I just can't, I can't help but think that's probably what he's saying. But that's again the favor of God that I think is happening here. So now this is the point where Paul is now able to stay there for a year and a half and he's able to preach the word of God, teach to them daily, and, and he doesn't have any, any more um, persecution from anything that's, that's listed in the word. So this judgment allows Paul to stay in Corinth for that next year and a half. So it's fun to think about. He's in the next year and a half. He's establishing these churches. You have Justice who has a home church. You have Aquila and Priscilla. Crispus may have had a home church. So you have these people that are now you know, forming the, the Corinthian church. And so it's really fun to see that all taking place. So now, think about this. He's down in Corinth for a year and a half. Well, he's strengthening the churches. He's doing these things to edify the body of Christ, but he's doing something else that's monumental for us today is he's writing the New Testament. He, this is where, this is the point where he starts writing three of his, of, of his epistles. He starts writing First and Second Thessalonians and Galatians. So this is where we're gonna take a detour next week. And while he's in Corinth, because if you look at um, verse 18, Notice what it says. Verse 18 is, so Paul still remained uh, Paul still remained a good while. Then he took leave of the brethren and sailed to Syria and Priscilla and Aquila were with him. So that, so that year and a half is just that one verse. But we know in that year and a half, he's writing three of his epistles. So what we're gonna do next week is we're gonna look at the Thessalonian epistles. And then the week after that, we're gonna look at the Galatian epistle. And we're gonna see how this all overlays and why was Paul writing back to the Thessalonians? What prompted him at this point when he's in Corinth to actually write these letters? and same thing with Galatians. So I think that'll be pretty fun as we study the life of Paul as we go on. So, all right. Does anybody have any questions or comments that they want to talk about? So yeah, Gail, did you want to say something? Well, you know, you think about the Apostle Paul and he, he, you know, he was beaten, he was yeah. killed. He, I mean, I struggle with living today. <laughs> right. You know? Yeah. But he went through yeah. He, he, would, he persevered mm -hmm. and endured. Yes. Yeah. He By the grace of God. God. Yeah. God. Yeah. He, Paul was such an amazing man. Brilliant. He knew, the, he knew the scriptures and he was driven and he had God's help with that. Yeah. He's an amazing man. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I love about this, this set of verses right here is seeing the grace of God just come onto Paul's life. It being empowered by the Holy Spirit, the Jesus coming to him and visiting him, telling him that he's with him. I mean, I just put that to my life and all of us can associate that, that these are things that God does for us even now as we're going through these hard times. So we stay strong, we get emboldened, we stay together as, a bre as the brethren. That is so huge. I mean, you, you read Hebrews and it talks about how, you know, you had compassion passion on me in my chains and you came up and visited me. You know, this is, this is Paul talking. You know, Paul wrote Hebrews and he said, even in my chains you came and visited me. There was a, there was a, a you know, the, what we have as, as the brethren together can really help us get through those hard times as the Holy Spirit's empowering us and encouraging us. When you read 2 Timothy and Paul's asking Timothy to come join him. He says, share with me in suffering for the gospel. And he's asking Timothy to come join him. Paul knew he was, he was putting him in harm's way, but he knew the love of the brethren. He wanted him to come. He says, Luke alone is with me. I mean, these guys were risking their lives. You know, I think even that, whenever we, we, we've read that, that the, the um, whenever, um, I think it was James back in the uh, Acts chapter 15, he says, these men have risked their lives for, for sharing the gospel. You know, I mean, th that's what these guys did, you know. Yeah, you just persevere. Yeah, it's a, these are haters of God that are coming against us. And, and right now, we at least have some rights in America that we can say we can stand on. Um, but as soon as those rights go away, and we are now going to be, whenever we talk about, like I read that verse, you know, homosexuality is right there in what I read in, in Corinthians. Um, I won't, I, we won't be able to say that out loud without getting arrested. But that doesn't make, we don't stop. We preach the truth, and that's what, that's what Paul was, was doing there, is he was standing strong for the truth, even if it goes under persecution. I love the fact that you encourage us, because now, right now it's easy. It's yeah. easy. But yeah. I mean, and we all know that a 
eventually there's going to be come the day. Yeah. Where, no, you stand the line. Right. And it's not going to be easy. It's not going to be easy. Right, yes. But thank God the great I am is with us and in us. <laughs> that is, that's everything, man. Yeah. Stephen. Yeah. Just remember to get through the tough time. Just remember yeah. God is always in control. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. The, the afflictions, the light afflictions that we have are just, you know, don't even compare to the, the eternal glory, the eternal weight of glory that's waiting for us. That's what we have. Our If you fix your eyes on Jesus through this whole time, that's the answer to everything. Come, Lord Jesus. I hope of faith, being, seeing him face to face. That's what gets us through these hard times. Yeah. Praise God. Come quick. Yes. Come, Lord Jesus. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Let's go ahead and wrap up with prayer. Father, we just thank you so much for what you've done. You've given us these, this word. You've told us that, that yes, these aren't going to be easy times, that, that we are going to suffer persecution for your name. But thank you for giving us examples of you yourself was an example and also these great men of Paul and, and, and Timothy and Barnabas and Silas and all these great men, Stephen, and these men that, that gave their lives so that we could have this word. Father, help us to, to be like you, to be like, like these great men that the Holy Spirit rises up a boldness inside of us that we will not back down, that we'll stand for truth even in the midst of this persecution. Father, give us that grace to continue and, and give us that grace that we might have words seasoned with salt that as we're speaking to these people who you love that they might see the error of their ways and they may turn away from sin and turn to you, Lord Jesus. So Father, we just humble ourselves to you. So work in and out through us. Father, I thank you for edifying us and strengthening us and giving us that comfort that you are always there with us and guiding us every step of the way and that we will one day see you face to face. In Jesus' name, amen.